So, so if, if there, there is anyone, anyone that couldn't join us today, today that you think would be really interested in this, then they will have the opportunity to enjoy it at a later date. Um, the information will be posted on our website. Um, but before we get started, um, this is Audrey King from the Elwood House, so she's going to tell you about some things going on at the Elwood House, and then I'll tell you some things that we've got upcoming at the History Center, and then we'll get Jesse started here, so I will pass it over to Audrey. Uh, hi, everybody. My name again is Audrey King. I'm the curator over at the Elwood House Museum. Um, just a couple quick things going on over at the Elwood House. We have officially. Thank you. <laughs> Where's, Where's the, the, I can't find the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> um, we, we officially started giving tours, tours again. So the Elwood Mansion, Mansion is open. And um, for the first time since COVID, we are going, going through all four floors of the mansion on tours. tours. So um, we've, we've got, got some really exciting things happening with restoration. restoration. We've, we've uncovered, uncovered new colors, colors in the ceiling. ceiling. Um, and uh, we're, we're doing, doing a lot of work in the house, house so it's an exciting, exciting time, time to visit the Elwood Mansion, mansion. And I would encourage you to do that, that if it's been a while since, since your last visit. Um, and we've, we've got, got some other, you know, exciting exhibits and stuff coming up the, the pipeline. And kids, kids programs, programs are coming back in the spring and summer, spring so, summer. Keep so keep an eye out for those things. things. Um, but yeah, yeah, galleries and the tours are open, so come see us. Thank you. Uh, so we've got some things upcoming here at the History Center as well. Um, our May Brown Bag lunch will be back over at the Elwood House. Um, Brian, Reese, and I will be giving you kind of a sneak preview to our Arts in Action exhibit. Um, some of you may have looked at it. We have an online version. But, but it is our work, so it is certainly a lot more powerful and impactful when you get to see it in person. And one of the pieces I think is eight feet by six feet. So um, online, you really don't get a sense, a sense of that with something that massive. Um, but that, that project, we look at the um, Black and Latino history in DeKalb County, and we start that conversation by looking at our work. And it was only going to be on display for six weeks. Uh, so the grand opening will be on May 21st, and it will go through July 2nd. And we're also going to have some different programming going on, some here at the History Center, and then also some over at the Elwood House. Um, we also are kicking off our guided walking tours. Our first one of the season will be on Sunday, May 15th. They're five dollars a piece. We um, are asking people to sign up online just um, to give out hand give hand out. So it's always helpful, helpful if we need to know if we can buy by twenty. 20. Um, which we had, had um, over, over twenty, 20 on, some on some of these tours, tours last summer. summer. So um, if, if you, you haven't, haven't gone, gone on these tours, tours there are just a, um, a wealth of knowledge is shared by Steve Bigland, and um, there are some new ones that are going to be added on towards the end of the summer as well. Uh, on your way on your out, way out if, you if you haven't been here in a while, there is a booklet with information about our current exhibit, the history of DeKalb County and other objects. We have 50 of them here at the History Center, and then another 50 can be found throughout the county. So some of them are physical buildings, some of them are landmarks, and some of them are displays at some of the different historical societies. So I'm going to call on Wade Callister in the back, and he's from Waterman with the Waterman Historical Society, and um, they have a wonderful uh, barber shop on display that was in town, and then they just like almost transferred everything um, into their historical society. So that's one of the 50 objects. Um, is that um, that Part of Ottoman history. Uh, there, there are, are also, also there's an opportunity to look at, at where these places, places are at online. Um, so, so just go to our website and you can see all those details as well. Um, so now I'm going to introduce Jesse Hayes LaRue on um, Exploring Jacob Hayes. Uh, she has been here, um, gosh, I mean, almost like over a year, I think, been doing research and finding different nuggets. And it's just wonderful to watch um, because. My historians know that our job is really detective work, and we're just putting together these different pieces here. And you know, I don't think anyone's looked at some of this stuff for a really long time, and so it's just great to see these pieces come out again and and to share at least the parts of the story that people, that people um, aren't that familiar with. Um, with. Um, and Jesse also um, is very excited to start a new path in her career. She is the the new uh, executive director over at the Glen Homestead. Um, Rob Glover, who was the previous director, is now here um, full time at the History Center as our archivist. So lots so of lots exciting, exciting changes, changes going on here, here. Um, with, with the history field, field in the Health County. So, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jesse, and then um, we'll have time for questions at the end. And um, those of you at home uh, watching this, if you have any um, questions, you can put them in the chat box, and um, we'll go ahead and um, make sure to include those as well. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Jesse. 
welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, to start with a little bit about myself, in case you haven't met me. Um, my name is Jesse Hache LaRue. Um, Jacob Hache is considered my fourth great uncle. Um, that was something that was told to me as a kid by my dad, you know, kind of introducing the story of Hache and why he's so interesting in DeKalb and we toured Glidden and Elwood and that's kind of where the, in, the inspiration and excitement started. Um, in 2016, I started my own website specifically about Jacob Hache to share articles, photos, anything about him since he doesn't have a museum or anything about it. I figured if I wanted to read it, I would have to write it myself. So <laughs> I've been doing that for years now. Um, Right now, I've been coming to the Joiner History Room and just researching anything and everything about Jacob Hache. Um, that was kind of inspired by Rob Glover. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Um, a little bit about Jacob Hache. He was born in 1826 in Germany. He came to the United States with his family when he was about nine years old. Uh, they started on the East Coast. Jacob was about 19, he would come to Illinois. Um, he came to DeKalb before it was DeKalb. It was called Buena Vista at the time. Um, he took his first hundred dollars, went to Chicago, the city's carpentry business. Um, he was the builder of many DeKalb homes, some of which stand today, um, including the Glen Homestead. Um, the story of barbed wire, I'm sure you've all heard some iteration of it, but Wood, Glidden, and Hache all went to the DeKalb County Fair, which is now on the, the grounds of North University and they were all looking at a fencing exhibit which was uh, wood posts with barbs sticking out of it uh, by Henry Rose of Waterman that was his creation and the story goes that these three men are standing there and they go I can improve that and they all walked away to go do their own things um, Glidden and Elwood would team up together but he should kind of forge his own path and create his own business um, he had many barbed wire creations and patents um, the most famous is his S barb. Um, and I do have some samples up here if anybody wants to take home a little piece of S barb. Um, but basically there would be litigation throughout this whole process of who was the actual inventor. Was it Glidden, was it Hache? It would go to the Supreme Court and it would go to Glidden. The day he died would say he was the father of barbed wire. He did not let anyone forget that. Um, beyond barbed wire, he also uh, patented uh, corn shellers, gas engines, many other objects. He was really just an inventor and just really wanted to improve the life in America. Although Elwood, Glidden, and Hage had their differences, they would work together all the time to improve DeKalb, um, including bringing together financial resources um, to bring Northern Illinois University to DeKalb. Um, later in life, he would be a banker and owned the Barb City Bank. And um, late into his 90s, uh, the stories go that he was sitting in the lobby and would chat with anybody that would come in. Hey, how's it going? Welcome. And he was just very, very involved in the community. And um, a lot of articles referenced him as Uncle Jacob. Um, he was really a big part of DeKalb and left his mark on it. <laughs> During his life, he gave a lot of money to charity anything philanthropic. Um, and he would die in 1826, just three weeks before he would have turned 100. Um, and there was some articles that reference, you know, he was really excited to turn 100 years old and he almost made it. <laughs> um, he did not have any children of his own. So instead of passing down a family fortune, I didn't see any of it myself. <laughs> um, his will specified that the money should go to the DeKalb Public Library. It was the Haitian Memorial Library, not the DeKalb Public Library. Um, the Jacob Hache Memorial Hospital, which is now Barb City Manor, and tons of other charitable projects, organs to churches, anything like that. Um, so many of these donations are still in use and we're, we're using them today. So Rob Glover of the Joiner Room approached me and wanted to know if I'd seen any of the Hache pieces here. And I thought I had, and I kind of thought that, you know, we had seen everything there was to see. I mean, everything's been dug up already, right? <laughs> um, what he did was surprising. Um, this is Past Perfect uh, Museum Database, and he just searched Hache. That was it. And he came to me with this, 30 pages of results, which was <laughs> really surprising. Now, it's, it's pretty generic. There's things such as Hache School, Hache Gym, um, references to the library, but there were a lot of things specific to Jacob. 
and a lot of things that I had never seen before. And I don't know that they've seen the light of day in a long time. So it really renewed that interest for me. And I was ready to get these items out in front of people and see what people think. So what we would do is we took our little cheat sheet. Oh no. <laughs> Time out here. <laughs> we'll be back in a second. <laughs> oh. Quick intermission. here that pop now okay okay try that again <laughs> so what we would do is we would take our sheet of references um there was a box number uh reference to a specific envelope and i would just say okay this sounds pretty cool let's pull that box so this is what we were working with um i could just pull the one envelope that said it was hache related but they are still working on fine tuning how things are pulled from the archives and the specific descriptions and things. So I would actually go through every envelope in the box to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, so I saw a lot of cool decal history. There's a lot of things beyond barbed wire, but um, you know, just pull open an envelope. Oh, there's a picture of the Haitian mansion I've never seen before. So that was really, really fun. And it was kind of just like a, a treasure hunt to see what you would find that day. Um, the, one of the biggest, most exciting things I found, which seems pretty simple, but it is Jacob Haitian's signature, which I've got a couple times up here. Now, it doesn't seem that exciting, but the story that I had always heard was that Jacob was illiterate, being from Germany. That was kind of like a local lore that he couldn't read or write and just kind of push things onto um, his right hand man, which is C.H. Salisbury. So seeing his signature in a couple places right below his right hand man, who writes in a very different font, um, was very, very exciting. Um, the signatures that I found were actually on school board documentation. So he was actually signing petitions to promote and benefit the DeKalb School District at the time. We found some objects as well. It wasn't all just pieces of paper. So we did find a couple of hash pins, which I have been trying to figure out what they mean and where they came from. I've been putting out pleas on the internet and have had no, no results. Um, but we have two pins that just say Heche, um, a newer, more modern one, almost looks political to me. And then this, this fancy older one uh, that's red, white, and blue. So, you know, when you're pulling out these things, you're just trying to figure out what it means. And could this be a political pin? Is it related to Jacob or a completely different Heche in DeKalb County? Um, this older pin, is this something that he wore or... Why do we have this? Um, the documentation associated with it was just the, the size of the pin and the word hash. So that's what we have to go off of. So I just keep putting these things out there to see if anybody knows anything more, but it's kind of a mystery with it. And you never know, one day, five years from now, somebody will say, I have that pin and that's from hash school. But we just keep trying. Um, this was me as well. Um, so Jacob Hesh, uh did manufacture gas engines um, and his brand was the Chanclear. He used a rooster in a lot of his advertising. And this is actually a completely intact window advertisement. So on the back, it actually has the instructions for how to um, attach it to like a glass front in a store window. Um, it's never been used. We pulled it out of a box and it had a piece of glass on top of it, but the color was still completely vibrant. Looked like it never seen the light of day and it was really gorgeous. Um, Chanticleer gas engines manufactured by the Jacob Hage Company in DeKalb, Illinois. Um, Jacob was really big on advertising and used a lot of colors and very, very flashy advertising for the time. He was kind of ahead of his time in that way. We did find some items on Jacob's wife, Sophia, as well, which excited me because I don't know a lot about Sophia. There's not a lot of information out there on her. Um, when I had read her obituary once, she was referred to as Mrs. Jacob Hesch throughout the entire obituary, never by her first name. So I see anything that refers to her and it's really exciting. Um, we have a picture up there of her up there. But what I found was her calling card. It was actually in a stack of other prominent DeKalb women's calling cards. And 
I didn't know what a calling card was, but <laughs> we did some research and basically Sophia would, if she was out on town visiting other people, she could leave this card that she had been there to visit or to speak with someone. Um, and she had the fanciest little calling card out of the stack. She had the nice scalloped edging and um, Mrs. Jacob Haitian cursive of DeKalb, Illinois. Also with Sophia, um, I learned a lot about her and that she was much more involved in her husband's business ventures than I would have assumed of a woman at that time. Um, we found her stocks in the Jacob Hayes State Bank. She actually owned 219 shares in the bank. And we also found documentation that she was considered a co-owner. Um, so, you know, you're going through these items and you start to wonder if, you know, if Jacob had passed first, what would that situation have looked like? Um, I, it's hard to find a lot of documentation that says, you know, a wife in the 1800s is owning as much as her husband. And that was very interesting to me. Um, perhaps because they didn't have children, she was more involved in the business ventures, but we actually have a stock book up here that you all can look at after. Um, it shows Jacob and Sophia's stocks in the bank. And then this is just the backside of the certificate showing her 219 shares given to her uh, May 8th, 1911. And then uh, Jacob actually was the, the witness and signed it as president as well. So we get to see that signature again. We found some really great letterhead. Um, like I said, with Jacob and his advertising, um, he was very creative, colorful, used artwork, poetry, a lot of different things. So once again, we see that rooster um, and this is advertising his wired implement company. So specifically the barbed wire rather than the engines. Um, but this is advertising the wire, his gates, stretchers, staples and nails. He didn't just sell wire, he sold everything that you would need to put it up. Um, another object we have up here is the actual seal that was used at the Jacob Hayes Memorial Hospital before it became Barb City Manor. So we got out a piece of paper and had to <laughs> stamp that as well. Um, but this was the seal that was used on different documentations that this is the corporate seal of the hospital. Um, it's still in great shape. Um, yeah, it's pretty neat. And then I really just wanted to share this because I've never seen a check for $100,000 before. <laughs> um, but basically after Jacob Hayes died, um, like I said, his will said how his money would be tied up and where it would go. And there was a board of trustees that would make sure that that was taken care of. And this is a check for $100,000 to make the Jacob Hayes Memorial Hospital happen. Um, there were other checks as well. Um, for the library and um, he paid a lot of hospital bills after his death for low income people in the DeKalb area. But this was by, by, by far my favorite. So not every day you see that, but, um, and it was also signed by Paul Nearing, another big fear, figure in DeKalb. He was part of the trustees. So that is just the gist of what we've been discovering, but we have some items up here that you can check out. Um, we have a calendar that shows the uh, Jacob Hayes Library, um, the bank stocks. We have a program from his opera house in downtown DeKalb that um, shows the quartet that was playing that weekend. Um, but basically my main take is that there is a lot of things to discover in DeKalb. It, everything has not been put out there. There's so much more to discover. You know, we're finding things, people are reaching out to me, they found something in their basement or it's sitting in an archives, but there's a lot of opportunity to just get out there and find it for yourself, whether it's, you know, a family member or your home. And I just really want to reiterate that there's a lot of great resources out there and I hope you find something for yourself as well. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll open up to questions in just a minute, but one thing I just wanted to share is that, um, and some of these things that Jesse looked at, some of them hadn't been out, um, hadn't had been in the collection for many, many years. I would say some of them had been donated in the 1960s. Um, but then we also have um, that seal that was donated, I would say within the last year and a half, two years. Uh, so that's also the challenge 
challenge of doing this kind of research is there is always new material that is coming. So um, it's called job security, I guess, in the history field, because uh, you you never get to the end. There's always new things, new stories, new perspectives that um, we are being able to add to um, to the story. So um, what Jesse has been able to find um, is, is exciting. And we're always like, if anything else comes in, we'll let you know, because it is, it's, there's people find things in attics and basements and like, I don't know what to do with this. Do you guys want it? And we're like, yep, give us a call before you throw it out and we'll go through it. And there may be just a few things in there that are good fit, but give us the choice or the opportunity to look through those things because once it's in the garbage, it's too late. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'll let you call on people for different questions and I can see if there's anything online here. Nope, no questions. On. Okay. Question? Yes. We talked about his mansion a little bit. Yes. I, we do have a picture here. Uh, I don't have it on the screen, but um, this was located on the corner of 3rd and Pine Streets in DeKalb. Um, it was torn down in 1961. Um, but we do have a lot of great images that we've found over the years, so we can really appreciate it. Um, this was because he was a carpenter, it was of his own design. Some people call it a little gaudy or tacky. Um, there's, we found bricks and things from it, but it's kind of mismatchy. He had rooster statues. He had a large lion and a bear that greeted you as you walk, walked up. Um, he definitely had a very eccentric style and taste. Um, there was a sign that hung up that said it was the home of Jacob Hage, the inventor of barbed wire, even though that's been disputed many times. So he, he stayed true to that, but um, really gorgeous mansion. I have pictures of that on my website as well. We found color ones. I've met with people that got into the house before it was demolished and took some really neat color photos of it as well. So um, I could talk about the house for days, but it's really gorgeous. We do know it was three floors, similar to the Elwood house. Three floors. Yes. Um, we don't have anything good to compare it to other than the carriage house that was part of it is still standing today. So what I've done is kind of stand there and look at the carriage house in person and have my photo and it towers over the carriage house. Um, it's a four, it's a four, I guess it's four sets of apartments now. So it, it's not a small carriage house but the mansion towered over it. So um, I've heard stories that it was similar in size or even taller than the Elwood house, but that's never been written in stone. <laughs> yes. Yes, I have a wish list. Um, I think the biggest thing is that there are some stories that he had adopted a son named Franklin, Franklin Hayes. Um, he shows up on and census papers as living in the home, but I have never been able to track him down, find out what happened to him. Um, apparently he did go to some sort of sanitarium in Southern Illinois while he was living with Jacob Hayes, but that place did burn down along with any records. Um, cemetery plot, I have not been able to anything but that would have been the only child he had um so that's probably my biggest thing is where did where did he come from who was he related to how did he become part of the Hayes family i have no idea <laughs> hopefully we'll find something yes um his father was married twice two different marriages and he had 13 siblings between the two so lots of cousins and descendants and lots of There, there was at least one in Malta, um, so they are kind of spread out, but there was a lot in Ohio as well, which is where his father was living at the time. Okay. Yes. Yes. Germany. Yep. And he came here when he was about nine years old with his family. I believe so. Um, his his original siblings did, but then his mother passes away. His father remarries and has an, another set of children. Yes. I believe. Yes. I believe so. 
1926. It was 99. Just a few weeks to 100. <laughs> I, and that's not my strong point. I would have been in his late 40s, early 50s, if I'm doing my math correctly in front of a room of people. <laughs> I just think his math makes sense. Um, my knowledge of big fish is always the barbed wire. And mm -hmm. I It was after the barbed wire. Yes. Yes. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> no, you can do that at any age. And um, and he was much younger in comparison to Glidden. Um, you know, he would get out of the business pretty quickly because he was older. But you know, Jake was continuously inventing. Sometimes I think that, you know, he was a little scorned that he wasn't the inventor. Well, I'm going to go out and invent 20 other things, and I'm not going to just stay to this one path. And, you know, gas engines were huge at the time to help farmers, you know, take care of their land, and it was very innovative at the time, for sure. Yes? Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's really I have. Yes, <laughs> there is one that has her name on it. Um, the safety pin had already been invented, but it was an improvement to the safety pin in the class. Um, Jacob was, was listed as a witness, but Sophia is the inverse. So once again, she was just out there doing just as much and putting her name out there as well, which is really neat. Yeah. Um, it's pretty limited, to be honest. Um, she was from what is now the Naperville area. Um, her maiden name is Sophia Ann Brown. Um, Jacob actually worked on her father's farm for a little bit. That's how he met her, and they would get married. Um, I believe her relatives come from the Iowa area, but like I said, with her obituary, it was a lot about Jacob and Mrs. Jacob Hayes. And so she's someone that I'm still trying to find as well, and I'm hopeful. We did find um, a picture of her during our research. So this is, um, it's kind of hard to see, but it can go around. Um, it's a postcard of the mansion. It's got um, inserts of Jacob and Sophia, and you see a, a few people standing out of the lawn, and you assume that they work for them or something. But we actually zoomed in, and we were able to find Sophia standing by the front door. So we matched to some other pictures. And um, Jacob's not here, but Sophia's standing out front with some other people. So that was really exciting. We pulled up on the computer, and we were zooming in. That's Sophia, we found her, so she's out there, but we gotta keep finding her. Yes. Yes. Yes, I would absolutely agree with that. Like for the wire or that's a great question. Right. I would I would think the East Coast is where a lot of the, the wire was coming from, um, but I, I don't know a lot about that. I just know that they got their hands on a lot of it. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, I have them on my website for Haish. I can, I can show you after if you'd like. Um, but they were pictures that were taken just a couple weeks before demolition. So um, I think the gentleman was about 19 years old. He asked if he could go in there and just took his, because a Kodak brownie, and went around and took pictures of the inside. Um, there was quite a few fireplaces, things like that. So I have some of those photos I can show you. Um, I can figure it out. It'll take me a minute, but I can figure it out for you. <laughs> well, I'll get it for you. Yes. For the wire or? Yes, absolutely. Um, you can search um, the, the national patents. I just get on, I think it's 
patents.google.com and I search Hayes and you can find his re related patents. You can find Glidden, and Elwood, really anyone. Um, there's definitely a lot of resources out there to look at the actual patents that they submitted. We do have barbed wire in there, and we have a miniature of the model. If you do a patent, we have a model to go along with it. So we have a little model of um, Charles Rose, Henry Rose, Henry, Henry Rose, um, um, what he created at the Elwood House. They have the original. How big is it, Audrey? Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot bigger. Ours is a miniature, uh, but there is it's, it's a good sized model that then um, inspired the other main three of our wire barons to then create the barbed wire. So those are always the things that we're looking for too, is what we're looking for. We're going to put the, the patents themselves are, are great to see, but because they're paper, they're a lot easier to preserve versus these models that uh, some of them are at the Smithsonian, uh, but I think there's a lot more out there that were thrown away or just weren't saved. So uh, those are the ones that our high wish list is to, to have, you know, to see some of those as well. Do you know where that was yeah, donated um, from? Yeah, so I'm trying to think. It was someone actually at a bank. So I think that was kind of in their safety deposit box. And they were cleaning it out. And so that was part of um, one of the items that they think had just, they were cleaning the whole box that had, no one had paid for for a long time. And they did, there was no, you know, sometimes you contact family members. But with this, they thought it would be a good thing. And again, I love this thing. Well, I know I found this. I don't know if you'd be interested. I'm like, yes. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> drawings of it, but I'm not sure if that's still standing. Steve probably knows. <laughs> Steve knows. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I've learned a lot from Steve over the years, for sure. So he is the best resource. Yes. She did die before him. Because they're asking me all the number questions today. <laughs> I don't remember how long they were married, but uh, that was the only marriage, and they were married until their death. Um, I have to double check that for you. Yes. And after she passed, he was in the mansion for a while. Um, he did have a housekeeper, Anna Anderson, that pretty much took care of him until his death. And then he left the house to her in his will, and she continued to live there until her death. Um, but after that, because the house, there was no plan for it beyond Anna's life, um, it did kind of become part of the finances and part of the will. So um, that's when it was sold to uh, the church and a kitty corner from it, and it became part of their property. Yes. Yes, I believe they're happy there. I have. Um, a lot of it is um, stating, you know, Ann Anderson will get the, the house. Um, there will be the board of trustees created. Um, money is going to this, this great public library, which was put up in 1930, the years after his death, um, the Memorial Hospital, which is Barb's new manor. So he really did lay out, I want all this money to go right back into the Cal.
indicated that so and so got 150, but this other right. person only got 25. Is your sibling fit? So those are our fun documents that we we not we don't necessarily have them filed in the bill, but we have them as um, in property records or probate records like that in those um, official documents where we can see that sometimes we find those And Haitian's will is interesting. He does not name a single family member, so there was no fifty dollars for anybody. <laughs> um, he believed that. He had given everything to family and friends during his life that he wanted to, and the rest was going to go back to the city that, in my opinion, built him. So that's different as well. It did cause a lot of litigation, and there were upset family members and fights over that, but he made it pretty explicit. I gave you what I wanted to give you, and the rest is going back to the cow. So that's different. Yes? You know, when the construction was about wire ended, I do not. Um, I have to find that out for you. Yeah, I just wanted to get contact with the military in World War I. He did not. Um, I know other people did, but his wire was never used in war. Yes. Um, sorry, I was searching. I'm so curious about this house. Yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So that's where this all started was just putting it on a website so it lives somewhere. It's jacobhaystory.com and I share obituaries, articles, photos. Uh, I've interviewed Steve Bigelin and put his story with Hayes up there. Um, so if, if you'd like to check that out, that's kind of where the, the living history is. Thank you. <laughs> Another fun connection to the exhibit that we have on display is there was um, bit of a controversy. Uh, Jacob liked to throw his hat into uh, sometimes complicated things. So in the turn of the century, there was uh, a need for a new courthouse in DeKalb County. And DeKalb was like, you know, we're bigger. We should really be the home to the courthouse in DeKalb County. And we have a copy of the petition that um, listed all the people that thought that the courthouse would be seen to not be sick anymore, that it should now be DeKalb. And Hayesh went as far as to have an artistic rendering of what that courthouse should look like. And it is gorgeous. So we have a picture of that on, on the panel to display. But I mean, it looks like it can rival some of the buildings in Washington, D.C. I mean, it's got this gorgeous rotunda, all of this like statue, I mean, it's phenomenal. See, he definitely did have a vision for big things. Um, and he was one of the main people behind getting that courthouse in Cal that also went all the way to the Illinois Supreme Court and lost. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of the few instances he worked with Elwood as well. They both had said we would put up X amount of money. It was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and it, it fell through, but that was like NIU, another thing that they were going to work together on. It fell through, but <laughs> it's interesting to see what would bring these competitors together for sure. What is this part? Um, so the land was donated by Joseph Finn, um, because that was his property. Um, he actually donated the first $10,000 to buy the books at the library. Um, so Founders Memorial Library is named after the founders, Elwood Glenn Page, Rosette. Um, but a lot of it was the library um, and donating the books and funds. Um, I believe that all three men were also there on the opening day of NIU. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so Jacob had basically a mausoleum. It's a three pillar, um, and they are entered below. Um, but essentially, when Fairview was being built. Where Jacob Hinch is, I don't know if you've seen it, it's all the way in the back, out by the pet cemetery, behind some bushes, he's all the way back there. But when he was setting that up, they believed that was going to be the entrance of the cemetery. Well, he gets put out there and switcheroo, and now he's all the way in the back. So as much as he tried to do these things and be flashy and be at the forefront, little things like that kept happening. So um, Glidden and Elwoods, are a little bit further up front and Haitians gotta go for a drive. <laughs> but he is there with Sophia. Yes. He 
does, yes, for the design. So that is only his. No one else will be using that. <laughs> right, you, you can see it. You can see it along the bottom of the stone. the first person I've heard that story from. I've heard that story from many people that grew up near it. It would kind of go the long way around. Um, on the reverse side, I've heard that Jacob had the only limestone fancy sidewalk in town. So kids would play marbles out on his front sidewalk. So I've heard both sides that they were terrified of the lions, and but it was also the hangout spot. <laughs> This is like in a blog post form, but I'll click through it here. These are some of the Kodak Brownie interior photos. Um, there were multiple chandeliers in the mansion, and um, some of these items are actually still out in Rockton, Illinois. Um, so if you go to the, the Chinese restaurant out in Rockton, you can sit and dine under the chandeliers. Um, a lot of the items were salvaged as the mansion was preparing for demolition. We've got fireplace as well for many throughout the home here's another one they're a little blurry from the time and everything but you know, multiple fireplaces have you been to the library? i have yes steve and i actually took a trip out there years ago um and we went to the golf course where the lions are still at if you wanted to go visit <laughs> um they're out at the golf course you can pull up and see them and then we went out to lunch at the, the chinese restaurant and sat under the chandeliers um, and they have some of the woodworking as well going up the stairs from the mansion. So Walter Williamson who owns um, the, the, the properties out there he actually purchased rights to fill up a truck and was taking pieces off and used it for the, the various properties out there and some of them are, are still out there. Um, so the detail of the wall um, this is um, from the bottom of one of the lions. There's a <laughs> nice close up of what would greet you as you walked up the front sidewalk. Um, there's a lot of descriptions of different murals on the walls. Instead of wallpaper, he actually had painters come in and paint murals onto the walls. And this is kind of the grand staircase. You can see the murals somewhat going up the walls. But this was in, it was right before demolition in the 60s. The church had owned this building for a long time, but a house of this magnitude, this size, outrageous, outrageously expensive to upkeep and take care of. And you start to see that a little bit in these photos. And then this is the base of one of the lions, um, has HV4 built by Jacob Heche and um, his face for the house. See if I have any more for you. Uh, this is the lions out at Rockton right now. So they've they've seen some wear and tear over the years from the elements. 
Um, I know that people have approached the golf course about seeing about getting these things back to DeKalb and their rebuttal has always been, well, it's, it's been here since the 60s. It's part of our history too. People are very attached to them. We got a close up lion, bear. <laughs> Um, one of the statues does say patentee of barbed wire, not inventor, but patentee this time. Um, and these are just details in each statue. We got Steve <laughs> from our <laughs> And this is what I showed you that picture built by Jacob Hayes. This is what it looks like now. It's not in the best shape. Um, below his nose is kind of deteriorated and gone. It's in the ground, but he is out there. And that one I showed you as well, that close up. And then when you go to the restaurant in town, this is some of the woodwork. They just put it right into the decor, but these are um, spindles and things that would have been used in the home. And some of the detail as well. So it's a lot like the research, it's out there. You just, you don't know where it is. You don't know where to expect it, but it's out there to find. I don't think Chinese restaurant would have been on my radar. Absolutely oh, not. Yes, it is. Thank you. China yeah. Palace. A lot of great details. And then the chandeliers. They're still in pretty good shape. So. <laughs> I definitely recommend taking a ride up there and swing by the golf course and get some lunch if you want to see some page history. <laughs> yes. Great. Any last questions, stories? Yes. Do you think um, the lions were um, carved from the same person who did the gargoyles? That's a great question. I, I do not know, but that's definitely worth looking into who would have done that or where it would have came from. I don't know, but I'd love to find out. Kind of a specialty, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it would be a bad connection. Audrey, do you still have the 125 year and display of NIU? Yes, I do. And I think, I think that the person who carved the gargoyles would likely be a different person to who worked on the Beach Mansion because I think I like to hire the architect for Alec Lovett's Hall. So it would have been a Chicago firm working on that building. Um, but yeah, in our visitor center right now, we do have the exhibit about the founding years of NIU. And um, there's more about the architecture and, and the involvement of all the founders in that. And how long will that be up for? A while? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> for a while still, yeah. yeah. We've got some items up here if you want to come up and take a look at some of the items we pulled and otherwise I'll be hanging around. All right, wonderful. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. This was excellent. <laughs> and hopefully we'll see you in May at the Elwood House for the Arts and Action Program. So thank you all so much. <laughs> Thanks.